Hi, John Hess from Filmmaker IQ. On my last video detailing the origins of 44.1 and 48 kilohertz, I vowed to stay away from the high sample rate debate and let the audio files hash it out. That is, should we record and play back higher sampling rate than 44.1 or 48 hertz for better audio quality, for example, 96 kilohertz or even 192 kilohertz? Well, the topic is too delicious. And through the comments I received on that previous video, I discovered a lot more on the topic and I wanted to share one discovery that really opened my eyes and really got me to understand what was going on. It kind of settles my mind on the whole discussion. First, a shout out to this video, DA and AD, the digital show and tell Monty Montgomery at ziff.org. This is the perfect primer to what I'm about to talk about. I'm not going to rehash everything that Monty covers in that video because there's absolutely no point. He does such a brilliant job laying it all out. That's why it's commonly linked, commonly linked everywhere. It's absolutely perfect. Seriously, go watch that video if you haven't, then come back. But I doubt most of you will follow through. Let's just forge ahead. And if you, if you get lost, you can always go back and revisit Monty's video if what I'm saying doesn't make sense. So, in the discussions, I seem to sense that there are three camps of the high sample rate debate. One camp says, Absolutely, you can tell 44.1 from 48, 48, anybody can. I can't believe the corporate overlords are saddling us with this crappy CD format. First, those people are idiots and really the cause of most of the fewer on the interwebs. They, they've convinced themselves that everyone is sheeple and only they, the pure anointed ones, know any better. More is always better forever. It's sort of like that joke in The Simpsons where Martin, who's running for class president, claims that the state inspector found 1.74 parts per million of asbestos in the classroom and Bart counters with, That's not enough. We demand more asbestos. More asbestos. More asbestos. More asbestos. More asbestos. More. Then there's the camp that says human hearing doesn't go any higher than 20,000 hertz, and therefore anything above 44.1 kilohertz, even for recording, is always overkill. This camp is a bit more dangerous because they are right, but it's kind of science simplicism, and that's ironically anti-science. Unfortunately, this kind, of, this kind of science simplicism runs rampant on the internet, basically underlying the principle of Dunning-Kruger. The final camp are the ones you really need to pay attention to, the engineers. Unfortunately, because they are so deep in the technical aspect of it, they have a very hard time communicating the concepts, especially to an average human being who isn't as well versed in the fundamentals of the technology, which is why that video from Ziff is such a gem. I also shout out Alec at the Technology Connections because he also has a very great way of explaining complicated video topics. He has a video on this very subject as well. So what do the engineer types say? Well, I'll lean on one famous one, Dan Lavery, the founder of Lavery Engineering, who makes audio processors. He claims that 60 kilohertz is probably the ideal sample rate for audio production, and the closest common standard is either 88.2 or 96 kilohertz. Now, the first camp would feel totally vindicated. The second camp would scream, but you can't hear above 20 kilohertz. And the forum flame wars go on and on. I'm looking at you, gear sluts. Meanwhile, a few people actually try to make sense of what Lavery's point actually is. Now, I admit it, it's hard, but this demonstration I'm about to do is what opened my ears to the logic. And it was spurred on by this query I got from a YouTube comment that reads, I think the Nyquist-Shannon theorem does not hold true 100% just like the Fourier analysis. The human ear can distinguish a sine wave from a square wave at 10 kilohertz. If a sound wave is nothing more than the sum of sine wave components, then the human ear would be able to hear a 30 kilohertz sine wave, which it cannot. As we know, a square wave only contains odd numbered overtones or partials. So the first overtone or second partial of 10 kilohertz of a square wave is 30 kilohertz. And so I went to Adobe Audition and I generate a 10 kilohertz sine wave and then a 10 kilohertz square wave. Yeah, absolutely. You can hear the difference. Now I'm going to be working in 48 kilohertz in my file because it's easier to see what the math is doing. And know that you are watching and listening to this at 44.1 kilohertz because that's what YouTube converts every video to. 
but that's okay because everything under 22 kilohertz is mathematically exactly the same. Don't worry about it. So to re reiterate the proposition in the comment, if a square wave is just the sum of the odd harmonics of a sine wave, that is the addition of three times the frequency, five times, seven, nine, and so on, and we can only hear up to 20, 20,000 hertz, 20 kilohertz in an ideal situation, although the vast majority of adults can't really hear above 15 kilohertz. Okay, so if those two are true, then how is it we can tell the difference between a sine wave at 10 kilohertz and a square wave with the same fundamental frequency? The first square wave harmonic of 10 kilohertz is 30 kilohertz, well outside of human hearing. We must be able to sense higher frequencies. Well, some of you might know where I'm going with all this. The answer is aliasing. No, that's, that's alias with Jennifer Gardner. I said aliasing. First, let's drop that tone from 10 kilohertz to seven kilohertz. I think you'll get why in a second. Now the first harmonic of this square wave, this seven kilohertz square wave is gonna be 21 kilohertz, three times seven, just outside human hearing, but reproducible in the 44.1 kilohertz, which is what you are listening to on YouTube right now. Listen again to the difference between the sine wave and the square wave. Do you notice that the square wave sounds lower? Let's pull out the frequency analysis. Our sine wave shows one frequency right here, seven kilohertz. But our square wave, we have our fundamental frequency at seven kilohertz, our first harmonic at 21 kilohertz, and then all these other frequencies separated by two kilohertz. Remember, I'm working in 48 kilohertz. This is the clencher and what the second camp of the sampling rate debate misses. Nyquist Shannon mathematically proves that you can perfectly recreate an analog signal by sampling it as long as the sample rate is double the highest frequency. But if you have frequencies that are above that Nyquist limit of half the sample rate, then those ultrasonic frequencies get reflected downward and create aliases, fake frequencies. A trippy way to see this effect is by using a sweep. Here's that square wave again, but I'll turn on Audition's spectral frequency display. Each of those bands is a frequency in the audio. Now just to compare, I'll generate a sine wave sweep that starts at 100 hertz and goes up to 20,000 hertz. And you can see that frequency represented as a straight line. Now I'll generate a square wave sweep and Audition creates this mess. Notice we still have that fundamental frequency as a straight line, but then we have the first harmonic as a steeper line. When it gets to the Nyquist limit, it reflects down and starts heading down. And when it hits zero, it reflects back up again. The same with this next harmonic, only even steeper line. Up to the Nyquist limit, then back down, then up again. Now listen, and you can hear those alias frequencies bouncing up and down. This is why you don't want to sample too low a frequency. For example, why we don't just sample at 40 kilohertz, which is twice he the theoretical human hearing threshold, and just call it a day. It's because anything that is ultrasonic, higher in pitch than human hearing, will be reflected back down into the audible range as aliasing. So we need to ban limit our audio, that is to prevent any higher frequencies from getting sampled, actually some of the really low frequencies as well. This process is called anti-aliasing and it's essentially equalizing out the frequencies that we don't want so they don't end up as aliases in the audible range of audio. Now, if you ever played around with the parametric equalizer filter in Adobe Audition or any other program, you'll notice that you really can't make a hard cut. Everything's a curve. So if you kill everything above 22.05 kilohertz for recording CD audio quality, you're going to start affecting some of the frequencies below 22.5 as well. The argument against recording and mastering at 44.1 is that your headroom to work with is really only two kilohertz before you're reducing what is theoretically hearable. And two kilohertz isn't really that much when you're up there in that range. It's about the same ratio differences between A440 and B493. 
With 48 kilohertz, we have four kilohertz to work with, a closer to a minor third, or A440 to C523. If all our audio recording equipment is perfect and what you're recording doesn't have a lot of high frequency detail anyway, then maybe you could probably work easily within those given limitations. But microphones are generally limited to 20 kilohertz and you may have several stages that reject higher frequencies. So what could potentially happen is you lose a little bit of power in that highest range of human hearing if you are only recording at 44.1. But the key word here is potentially. Now, the reason why 60 kilohertz has been suggested as a good goal for optimal sampling rate is because the Nyquist limit at 60 is 30 kilohertz, which is a perfect fifth above 20 kilohertz, the theater, theoretical maximum of human hearing as headroom for our limiter to work. But we get a bonus at these high sample rates because even if our anti-aliasing limiter isn't perfect, the few higher frequencies that slip through, when they get reflected back down, they're still outside this limit of human hearing. At 60 kilohertz sampling rate, we have effectively a full octave above 20 kilohertz as headroom, 10 kilohertz to reach the Nyquist limit, and then 10 more as it reflects back down into the audible range. So then why not even higher? Why not 192, 384? Well, there is an issue of computational power and storage space. Although yes, audio is far smaller than video files these days, when you're mixing, you're often mixing hundreds of tracks with effects chains, and you're asking your computer to do double or quadruple the amount of processing power per track for really no audible benefit. But there also exists the possibility of having all those extra high frequencies creating distortions in the form of intermodulation. Now, before we wrap it up, I just want to cover some interesting notes that are worth looking at. First, the question, why would Adobe Audition create a square wave with all these aliases? Wouldn't it band limit the frequency? Well, I think the reason is the tone generator doesn't actually generate a wave at all. It just creates a pattern of samples that look like a square wave. If we zoom all the way into the waveform, you see a series of dots. If we connect the dots with straight lines, we get a classic square wave but you can't connect the dots with straight lines. You need to turn them into a sum of sine waves via, via the Fourier transform, which I don't have my mind wrapped around, so let's just leave the how at that for, for now. The key thing to remember, however, is that given a certain sample rate, only one curve, only one sum of sine waves will be able to fit this series of points. But in finding that series of sine waves, we end up with a representation of a square wave that has all these little vibrations at the tops and bottoms of the waves. This is called the Gibbs phenomenon. And it's in these little vibrations where all these other aliasing frequencies manifest themselves. See how this formation here reappears as a trough a few blocks away, and then it reappears again as a crest again. This is an alias frequency lower than the fundamental frequency of the square wave. Now, if we had an infinite number of samples, we could get rid of the Gibbs phenomenon and create a perfect square wave but nothing is infinite, especially not with something like sound, which is a compression wave. So it's by very nature sinusoidal or in layman's term, curvy. So you're always going to get aliasing so long as you build the square wave by constructing it from the sample in this manner. The interesting thing is you can actually create different sounding square waves just by changing the sampling rate. Now you are listening on YouTube at 44.1 kilohertz, which doesn't affect things once the wave is already constructed. You heard what the seven kilohertz sounds like if I construct it using 48 kilohertz. Now here's that same seven kilohertz square wave sounds if I use 44.1 kilohertz as my base. It's completely different because the aliasing is completely different because the reflection point is different. And since 44.1 does not divide as evenly with seven kilohertz, we get even more series of aliasing. Now, after all this, let's go back to the original question that got me here in the first place. Can you tell the difference between a sine wave and a square wave at seven kilohertz? Yes, but that's because of aliasing, which we can't get rid of. We generate a square wave as sampling points. So let's generate the square wave by manually summing up only the sine waves that we can represent inside the Nyquist limited range. Now, since I want you to be able to hear this demonstration, I'll work in 44.1, even though it doesn't matter, but just to show you, we have a fundamental frequency at seven kilohertz. Our next odd number harmonic is going to be 21, 
which still is inside our band of 44.1. The next harmonic, the next odd harmonic is five or 35 kilohertz, that's too high. So we'll reject that and go with only those two frequencies, seven and 21. And the resulting waveform looks like this. And you can kind of see it still kind of looks like a square wave. Now let's listen to that and compare it to a regular sine wave. In fact, I'm not going to tell you which is which. I'm just gonna cut back between the two of them and see if you can hear a difference. Hold up, hold up, hold up. This is John from the future. Um, I edited the video, a, I uploaded to YouTube, and just to make sure I was delivering the acoustic content that I promised in my demonstration, I downloaded the video and did some frequency analysis, and sure enough, YouTube has wet the bed. It's not the first time I try to do a technical demonstration on YouTube, only have their encoding kind of screw everything up here. But yeah, so even though YouTube does deliver 44.1 kilohertz to you, it puts a hard limiter at 16 kilohertz. So any frequencies above 16 kilohertz get dialed to zero, nothing. There's nothing above 16 kilohertz on YouTube. So that demonstration where it had seven kilohertz and then a 21 kilohertz signal, nope. Just, it's, it's only seven kilohertz. If you wanna to listen to that original demonstration, I'll put a link in the description to a video on my Google Drive. You can just listen to that and see if you can hear the difference. But for the purposes of this video, I redid the demonstration going down to, the fundamental, to a fundamental frequency of 5.2 kilohertz. So we're gonna compare a sine wave at 5.2 kilohertz and a constructed square wave using 5.2 kilohertz as a fundamental frequency and the first harmonic, which is three times 5.2, which will give us 15.6. Now, 15.6 kilohertz is still within human hearing range, although it is above my hearing range, so I cannot hear this at all. Now, some of you young kids might be able to still hear it. Now, if you do, just remember that the 20 kilohertz theoretical peak or theoretical threshold and the 21 kilohertz I was demonstrating earlier those are about a perfect fifth above that. So take a listen and see if you can tell the difference. So there you have it. This is a video I didn't think I would make, but uh, here we are. Thank you for indulging this non-audio engineer in some exploration to the theory of digital audio sampling. Like, subscribe, ring that bell, do all the things that YouTube wants you to do, including increase my engagement by uh, making a name comment, trying to correct me for saying hertz at the beginning of the video instead of kilohertz. Play back higher sampling rate than 44.1 or 48 hertz for better audio quality. You know, I must be corrected despite the fact that, you know, I say kilohertz in the title. I use the correct SI units throughout the video. Y'all got to make sure that I know I made a verbal mistake because, yeah, I don't know the difference between kilohertz and hertz. I mean, I thought my audience would be smart enough to get what I mean, and probably 90% of you do, but always there's that one person, that one guy that's got it. Uh, I, I got to make sure he knows he said the wrong word. But whatever, thanks for the engagement. Special thanks to our folks at Patreon. You guys are awesome. Show your support by throwing me a few bucks. Get yourself some snazzy Filmmaker IQ merch on the web self, website, website, web shelf below. See, I, I always misspeak, get used to it. So all that's left for me to say is to go out there, sample something great. I'm John Hess, I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.